What's up, guys? My name's Ernie. I'm the pastor at Mercy Hill. Welcome to the Mercy Hill podcast. And we got some friends with us. We're going to be talking about family. And uh, we heard this morning from Troy as he taught through a passage about family. And, and uh, we're going to answer a lot of your questions. But first, let's do some introductions. All right. My name's Brent Haverkamp. I'm an elder at Cornerstone Church of Ames and uh, been married for nearly 33 years. I have four adult children, uh, mostly in their 20s. Um, they're all married. I have uh, one granddaughter that's nearly four and one on the way. All so, right. <laughs> so my name is Troy Nesbitt and I have seven children. I uh, have... Um, five biological children and then my wife and I decided to adopt when we were in our 40s and so we have what we call a second family. We have two adopted sons and my children, I have four of my five adult children that are married and we have our 13th grandchild on the way due in March and Pam and I have been married 36 years. All right. I'm Kirsten Neal and I'm a member of Mercy Hill Cincy. Um, Jim and I have been married for almost 30 years. We have two adult children um, and one grandchild and one getting ready any time. Well, there it is. And I, I've been married 12. I got three kids, eight, five, and two. And I am just, I feel like I'm the lucky one because I get to sit here. I've actually been looking forward to this all week because I just, I, I have all these questions, but I'm going to I, got a, I didn't put any of mine here. I'm just going to keep asking them. So I get about 45 minutes to an hour to just to just pick at your brains about being moms and dads, and you'll have a wealth of experience about that. So you're going to ask your questions and pretend that they were being asked by the church, right? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Right. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll probably say this one for me. Hey, asking for a friend. Like, I don't struggle with this, but <laughs> yeah. So, hey, let's just get right off the bat. Here's one of the first questions we had was, how are you meant to honor your parents after you get married? Like, what does that look like? Yeah, I would say one of the questions that we all have is what it means to honor anybody. And especially when God makes a specific, mm -hmm. you know, honor your father and mother, you're always going to have a father and mother. And, you know, I think we need to think what is honoring to us. And I think the best way that I could suggest is, and we would love it so much if when our parents hurt us, they would acknowledge that they hurt us and ask us to forgive them for their sins. Mm. But we never think about how often we sinned against our parents. And now as adults, if we choose to forgive our parents, that's super honoring, mm -hmm. even if they don't ask us to forgive them, because God has called us to do that. But what's even more honoring is if we actually take responsibility for our sins against them, and ask them to forgive us. And if a child will, an adult child will forgive their parents and then actually take responsibility for their sins against those parents, it, I have never seen anything that restores a relationship more quickly than that. Um, I have a situation, one of my son-in-laws uh, had a broken relationship with his dad for his whole life, um, in fact, the, the kind of things that his dad did and the kind of things that he saw his dad do were deplorable kinds of things. And so he was so bitter against his father. And then he decided as a Christian man, no, I need to forgive my dad his sins. And then he realized, oh, I want to get his forgiveness for my sins. And when he forgave his dad, it let him out of jail. But when he asked his dad to forgive his sins, his dad didn't know what to do with that and the last time that they were together he said to me he said that was it was the most life-giving time he's ever spent with his dad and the relationship was totally healed and his dad told him more in those four days they were together they loved him and they was proud of him than he did in his whole 30 plus years of life and uh, it's really a cool cool thing to think about yeah yeah, I find it so interesting that the thing that God calls us to do, which is honor our parents, is is honestly leading us to a better relationship with our family. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not, it's sometimes it can be seen very burdensome, but one of the things that I, I love finding out, like especially in John 15, 10, I really love how it says, uh, I, I've given you these things so that, you know, uh, my joy would be in you and your joy may be full. Like, 
right after he gets done talking about obey my commandments and it's such a and it's so obvious that what Jesus is saying is the rules I'm giving you are meant to lead to a better life for you like mm-hmm. they're meant to lead to life not to further burden yeah this question was asked a lot and it was asked in a lot of different shades mm-hmm. so and guys just jump in and share like there was some that were asking like well, how do I how do I honor my parents if they don't follow Jesus or how do I honor my parents how do I practically honor my parents if they're absent from my life you know, or if I don't live near them, um, you know, any, any suggestions, guys, just, I think it was a great way of thinking about it, but any suggestions on some of those questions? I think it's, some of it is just getting to know, you know, talking to your parents, like actually having real conversations with them about, you know, um, where, what is, what can I help you with? Or, you know, especially as our parents are getting older, you know, um, they're not the, they're not the same people they were 20 years ago. So um, that relationship, that dynamic changes and um, just being aware of where your parents are in life and what, where they may need help along the way. And um, I think just having, I know with our parents that having just real conversations with them means so much. Um, it's not just we're not just kind of skimming the surface of oh how are you doing and you mm-hmm. know but those just real sit down um, deeper conversations yeah, are just meaningful. being interested in them right. asking them questions <laughs> yeah. and discovering things about them yeah. hey, right. the older person gets the more they want to talk about themselves and when you actually take interest you actually can learn a thing mm-hmm. but I don't like the question Ernie I think it's a cop out only yeah. Christians ask this kind of question <laughs> Okay, so God is the one who said honor parents. Yeah. Didn't say honor Christian parents. But then we as Christians say, how are we supposed to obey God? Well, what about an unbeliever, right? I mean, what about the government? It says honor the government. We don't say, what if the Christian, what if our government's not Christian? I mean, it's crazy. And, mm. and the issue is not our parents, it's God. That's the issue. So if you can't obey God because of some problem you have with him and his perfection, then go your own way. Right. Right. But it doesn't change what God says just because our parents are sinful. And I mean, God pours out his mercy on us. It'd be like saying, well, God should only love us if we're lovable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Then we would never get any love from God. And so I think I so many Christians excuse their sinfulness. Right. In the name of Jesus. And that's what Jesus came to deal with. So. Yeah, I mean, I really think it's indicative of the gospel. You know, if we understand the gospel and while I was a sinner, while I wasn't pursuing God, he pursued me. Mm -hmm. And then because of that, I can have a changed life. When we look at people that aren't doing what we want in their lives, we're going to view them the goal is to view them more like Jesus sees them, more like Jesus saw me, you know, when I was in the depth of my sin. And so, you know, the, the gospel is transformative, and it certainly should be transformative transformative as we think about family. Yeah, I mean, it, it, family hurts. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so we think family shouldn't hurt us. But Jesus, <coughs> yeah. Jesus has called us to love our enemies, and the gospel is always upside down. It calls us to do those things that we would never do apart from it. And, and so uh, that, that is what makes unbelieving parents consider Christ, mm-hmm. is when you begin to treat them like Christ would want you to treat them when they know they don't deserve that. <laughs> they begin to think, oh, there's something to this Christianity. If you use their sin mm-hmm. to dishonor them, and they're unbelievers, right. how much more should you show them Christ? You're the closest thing they have. And if you're a poor example of a believer to them, right. what's their hope of the gospel? My dad uh, led the majority of his family to Christ, and it was because he acted like a Christian, <laughs> yeah. mostly. Yeah. <laughs> and just to reiterate, I mean, something that Troy said is really valuable that we can miss, that we can miss, we don't honor our parents because they're Christian, right? We don't honor our parents because they act Christian, or we don't honor our parents because they act how we want them to act. Mm. We honor our parents because that's like God, 
Mm -hmm. You know, and once we understand that difference, it, it'll it'll change how yeah. we're to think about it. Can I add something to that too? Like I, I know there's there's probably people out there that think, how am I going to do that when it's just a constant pain, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. hurt, like mm -hmm. you know, like you said, family's hard. Um, I think you just in your if you're in that situation, just knowing that you're you're doing this to honor them and not for yourself mm -hmm. and like you, you may leave just crying you know after mm -hmm. that but i think in the long run just continuing to do that and loving them and honoring them and taking taking your yourself out of that is it's it's hard for people. I'm yeah. just saying. Oh, I it's, mean, it's totally. And, yeah. and I and I would agree. And I think we need to caveat that and, yeah. and 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 say or just add an addendum to that. No one is saying to enter an abusive situation right. Right. or right. Uh, to put yourself in a position where you could be harmed or taken right. advantage of or abused in any way. And mm -hmm. we just live in a culture where a lot of that is taking place now. Mm -hmm. yeah. But the Bible was written in a culture where a lot of that was taking place then too. Right. And it never gave, uh, we always have permission to disobey our parents mm -hmm. if they're asking us to disobey Christ or doing something that is sinful. Um, and, and so there, there are limits and boundaries to that, but generally that is not yeah. the case. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, it's, I think a person asking a question is per perhaps confusing, honoring, and obeying. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, yep. and, and there is a distinct difference in that, like, yeah, like, it, it, I used to have this conversation all the time with students as a college pastor. And I'm right. like, hey, uh, I'm like, go honor your parents. And they're like, how do you do that? I'm like, well, let's see. When you go home for Christmas break, be a blessing instead of someone to be served. Like, look mm -hmm. to serve your family. And especially if you're not a believer, like when you come home and you become a burden because you're <laughs> sitting on the couch being a turd, you know, and like asking your mom and dad to do it. Like, you're acting like a child, but you want to be treated like an adult. Like, be an adult and go in a, like, if you were staying at a friend's house, I would sure hope that you would look to bless that family and contribute. They're going to let you sit a, stay at their house for several weeks or two weeks or whatever. And so it's it's very simple. Like, we know what it is to honor people. Yeah. Um, it, well, and I, I think you brought up a good point, too, there, Ernie, because the, the word in our text today, <clears throat> children, obey your parents. The word is not small child. <clears throat> The word that's in in the Greek, it actually has to do with household, okay? And so literally, it would imply if you're living under the roof of someone else mm -hmm. and they are caring for you, then you are now obligated to obey them. Mm -hmm. You know how a parent will say, hey, my house, my rules. That actually is rooted in that term. Mm -hmm. um, so so if, you're, if you're a big boy or girl and you're no longer living under the means of your parents and they're no longer paying your bills, you're assuming responsibility for yourself, now that shifts to you're no longer acting like a child, you're becoming a leader of your own life, family. And so the, the term actually shifts away from I say you do to actually honoring, and it's really honoring when you begin to assume responsibility for yourself. Having adult kids, isn't that great? When, when they no longer are looking to you to pay their phone bill <laughs> or their insurance or their rent or their whatever. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think that's great. And it leads right into one of the questions that we had that I think is going to fit pretty well. It says, how do you lovingly enforce healthy boundaries with family when they don't respect the boundaries you put up for your own mental health? You know, and this is one of those questions I think that's going... I think something I'd even add to that question for the conversation is, how do you how do you honor and obey your parents, but the things they're asking you to do, like are are obviously sinful or wrong or damaging. We caveat at that real quick, but I think adding like, let's talk about how do we put up boundaries, mm -hmm. and then and then how do but but how do we honor them at the same time, you know. I think I think it's a yeah. I mean, I, I'll, 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 so I'll, I'll start. And, we all have examples in our heads. Yeah. Yes, and, right now. And this is just as a as a parent who's watched his children get married and establish, you know, their own families. And I think in that environment, um, we have to respect that. Oh, th this is a separate family unit, 
and they're going to build their family in the best way that they know how. And clearly, as you know, what a fun thing it is for us to have you know people that we didn't raise but now are part of our family and you know it just brings a diversity and uh, a need to respect as we as we mm-hmm. and so Tori and I say oh well that's how that's how they do it and we try to you know there's a there's an elder in our church that talks about you know how do you believe the best and so that's something that it's we the bam yeah um, best available motive and worst available motive and so we say oh well this is what they're trying to do you know this is what they're trying to do and then we try to believe the best and bring that goodness and that diversity into our family and it's grown us as a family as as we've brought in-laws in oh and there. Espe- yeah. especially as you watch your children parent mm. and you you watch they have to they have to co-parent with their new spouse Mm -hmm. and you were raised a particular way and they were raised a particular way and you felt a certain way about the way you were raised and they felt a certain way and then when they have to coalesce when they have to bring that together and then you observe what they accepted from your parenting and what they're rejecting and you almost feel like they're rejecting you and then when all of our adult kids get together with all of our grandkids none of them parent the same and so then the conversations that are backroom conversations are about how the different ones parent and which kids are you know this way and that way and Pam and I've just decided the best response from our generation to their generation is uh, uh, mute (laughs) and you know if they asked we will say but if they don't ask we just talk to each other Right. right. You can talk about your kids with your spouse uh, and the way they parent, but you just go on mute and try to be yeah, good. You can't parent gossip parent. with yourself, right? Yeah. You know, you're one flesh. So. <laughs> and and we'll, we'll get this, but, you know, there's your kids will go through stages. And so when they're part of your family, you've got a particular relationship to them. Mm-hmm. Then once they get married, well, then you have a different relationship mm-hmm. with them. And you know, it becomes more of a supportive, you know, encouraging relationship. But the instructive um, is more, oh, if I'm asked, you know what I mean, then I'll give instructions. But those those days are past. Um, and, you know, same thing, you relate to your grandchildren different than you relate to your children. Mm-hmm. And so it's um, not so much to you know raise up that child in the way that it should go, but just oh enjoy them and you, you know and so it's it's a different relationship and I think you know my wife and I are starting to understand oh how do we relate in a different way to our children? Well, and I I think to to also say to that that um, the question was about boundaries. Right. You. Everybody assumes a different boundary than somebody else mm. and until you talk about it. Mm. The worst time to talk about it, though, is when you've blown up over mm-hmm. it. Okay, so I'll give you a great example that I'm embarrassed about. So my, my father-in-law owned a lake home, and my wife and I chose to go there for an anniversary. <coughs> and we told him we're going there for our anniversary. Mm. And it was his lake home, so he had a habit. When we're in his home, he felt invited to be in his home. <laughs> but I thought the key word anniversary would mean you're uninvited. <laughs> okay. And, and so when he showed up, um, I, I blew up, right, because it was a significant anniversary for, mm-hmm. for me and his daughter. And uh, we like to celebrate anniversaries like all happily married couples do. And I didn't want my father-in-law to participate. Yeah. And that was horrible what I did and hurt our relationship. Because if I would have had a clear conversation and established a boundary, he would have never come. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I didn't have the conversation. So to assume that our boundaries are the same is to only get us in conflict. And the only way to make that worse is to blow up. And then have that conversation. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so if it bothers you, you have to have that conversation and yeah. establish it. And you have to decide which cards you have and which one, which ones you don't. You know? 
Yeah, I, I'm just trying to think through that because I, I understand that situation. You had um, law interrupt your anniversary? Right, as well. right. No, I haven't had that. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think the the dilemma is back to one of the other questions: is how do we how do you have that conversation with an older adult um, parent and and still honor them and not like you know hurt feelings and mm-hmm. it, how do you how do you have that, how do you communicate it with them um, without having those hurt feelings and, or, I, I don't know, it's, it's, it's sticky, I think, um, for a lot of people, because I'm trying to think of, like, if I were in that situation, how would I have handled that? And having those conversations, how would, it, how would that have gone? Um, but I think it's necessary, mm-hmm. but I, uh, I'm sure that people listening will go, Okay, how, how do I start that conversation yeah. with that person or those people? Yeah, I, I think it's like it's having those because I do them poorly often. Um, and when I, do them, <laughs> I know, I'm, I know and me too. I'm like, when, uh, I, when, I do them, when I do them well, though, like I, I, some, uh, like I sometimes, the, the, when I do do them well, uh, a big part of it for me is, is, is it, having my heart in the right place. Mm-hmm. So when I do it poorly, my heart's in the wrong place, mm-hmm. and it typically brings about mm-hmm. wrong activity. But if I'm like, okay, my motive is to honor my dad and have this conversation about why he can't speak this way to my wife, mm-hmm. or, you know, or something like this, or like, or to, or my motive is that that's part of it too that I need to check how am I communicating it, mm-hmm. but I can't help the res- and if they have a bad response from that, you guys correct me and admonish me if I'm wrong about this. I can't help how they respond. I can only be in charge of what I'm trying to do. And there's always, you could always do it better, which is, you know, which I found myself apologizing most of the time, being like, I'm sorry, yes, I could have done that better. But, but if you acknowledge the elephant in the room, <laughs> yeah, mm-hmm. as you enter into the conversation, mm-hmm. yeah, I rarely have I been in one of those conversations and the person was <clears throat> unaware of the, the tension that already existed. Yeah. Okay? Because they have it too. They have some things they want to say about you. Mm-hmm. Right. And you need to be an adult enough to know that's coming back. Mm-hmm. If you open this conversation in the right way, at least you're going to get it coming back in the right way. Yeah, and, hopefully. And so if you say, hey, I love you. I want to do everything I can to have as good a family experience as we can. I want to talk about some things that are really awkward right now, and it's going to be difficult for me, and I'm a little nervous. Yeah. 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 But I would rather yeah, starting talk with about it. Yeah. Yes, and, yes. And, and that... Describes it a little bit. And I like what you said, too, kind of like you, it, get in, getting ahead of the game. Like right. not doing it <clears throat> in the moment, but you know that that's going to happen. So getting, it's planning that conversation, when it's going to happen, and where it's going to happen. And mm-hmm. I think it's important, too. Yeah, the, the, the vulnerability just displayed at the beginning, like, hey, I'm nervous to have mm-hmm. this conversation. It communicates, like, our relationship's really important. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, I respect you. I love you. Like, this has got to, and, and this is getting in the way of us experiencing a better relationship. Mm-hmm. Like those kind of things. Are, yeah, it's something my wife <clears throat> is really good at. You know, she can be really vulnerable, and you know, there's something she'll often start a difficult conversation with finding something in herself. You, you know, I mean, you, Troy, you mentioned it. You know, how do you how do you humble yourself and apologize? And if you can you know, start that relationship with that, maybe mm-hmm. with the right heart, like you talked about, it often changes where that conversation, and as parents, sometimes <coughs> we want to be the parent, and, mm-hmm. you know, sometimes, um, you know, we need to say, oh, okay, we're, we're a peer uh, to these people, and and let's start out the conversation as, yeah. a, as a lower level. Yeah. 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 So I just want to state one of the things I heard said too, and then go to a new question. That this is an Ernie question. I didn't, this is on the paper. <laughs> there's, some, there's some like it, but none like the one I'm going to give. Yeah, I said, uh, but I, I love the, the the bam best available motive. Mm-hmm. Like I think that's like that, that helps you with your heart thing right there. Like I've always heard it from like filling in the gap. You're gonna feel a trust or suspicion, mm-hmm. and but that is best available moment. Like if we just best available motive is always yeah. We call it bam or wham wham. Mm-hmm. Wham or bam? You always want to bam somebody yeah. rather than wham them. Okay. Okay. Say what those those acronyms are. Yeah. So best available uh, motive or bam, 
Uh -huh. um, and so oftentimes, um, as, as a parent or child, um, you know, my wife and I will have a conversation about one of our children. We'll say, can you believe? And, you know, then you have a choice at that point. You can say, well, I actually think they were trying to do this. Mm -hmm. You know, they were trying to parent like this. They're, they're trying to lead their family in the right way. Or we can say, can you believe how rude they, you, you know? And yeah. so that's worst available motive. That's wham. That's wham. That's wham. Yeah. Um, and, and so <coughs> if you can, I think oftentimes um, you can kind of fall in one or two patterns. And if you've been married for 30 years, it's, it's pretty easy to be comfortable and you can mm -hmm. just get mm -hmm. into worst available motive pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. But if you can start to believe the best, well, then it's going to change your relationship with whatever and, you're And doing. even if their motives are the worst, mm -hmm. if you believe the best, it actually minimizes the damage that can happen in a conversation mm -hmm. because you've given them the benefit of the doubt. Yeah. And now they're disarmed because they really didn't have that in their mind. Yeah. But you assumed that about them. Same thing yeah. for same thing for children here, you know. Um, as you think about your parents, sometimes you want to ascribe the worst available motive to mm. them. So I can't believe they always do that to me. Well, likely your parent loves you. You know what I mean? Yeah. They're they're actually doing the best that they know how. Um, they actually are probably good at some things and bad at some things. And if you start to think about, oh, they're actually not trying to do this thing that really <laughs> frustrates me that I'm ascribing the very worst motive mm -hmm. to, yeah. but they're actually, you know, in, in maybe a wrong way or without tact or however it is in a hurtful way, but they're actually trying to care for and love, you know, their children. Yeah, yeah. And, and I would say I'm, I mean, we're grandparents mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. uh, a single person knows a lot about marriage, and then they get married. <laughs> yeah. And then they realize, I don't know Jack about this. Yeah. And then a married couple knows a lot about parenting, and then they have kids. And yeah. then they realize, I don't know Jack about this. Yeah. And then as those kids get older, so the older you get, the more grace you actually will have for how bad your parents were yes. because you'll actually be more like them than unlike them yeah. as much as you wanted to be different than them. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's important to keep that you know, in mind as well as experience actually teaches you more than what you think you know. Right. Yeah. And you will have greater grace as time goes yeah. on. Yeah. Bam them, don't wham them. And I love, too, it's the last thing I'm going to say I'm the question. I love, too, how, Troy, in your talk today, you talked about a lot of times we look at our parents to be Jesus. And we would never put those expectations on ourselves, but we'll put it on them, mm -hmm. and we'll be disappointed when they're not. Mm -hmm. And then the, the necessity of coming in with a gracious, merciful, humble heart, and how that is, how, and like, in being vulnerable, like, it begots, it, be, it brings about vulnerability. Is, is so Did you just necessary. say begots? Yeah, <laughs> begots vulnerability. <laughs> yeah, I'm, that's such a pastor word. Begots. <laughs> yeah, reminds me of that song by uh, oh, what's his name? Uh, Andrew Peterson. Yes, thank you, Andrew Peterson. Those that are pastors here, is begots a real word? No, okay. I don't know. I think you made that up. Yes, no, begots. it's a word. Begots. Begot. Yeah, okay. only begotten. begotten. Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm probably saying it wrong. There's about a 90% chance I'm saying something wrong uh, when it comes to the English language. Like, it's my first language. It was so crazy when, quick story, it was so crazy when Josias was like sharing his testimony in, in English and he's from Panama. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I think your English is better than mine. Like, there's probably a good chance it is. Well, others were probably thinking that too, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's the Cajun. So, you gotta get a little bit of that in there. My son calls it Adeling. I come by, my dad does it too, and he calls my dad's name is, grandpa name is Ada. And so, when, when, my, when, my, when my dad says things that are weird, like he says, like Sunday instead of Sunday. He, my, my son calls it addling. And so he's like, so now he'll look at me and be like, Dad is addling again, <laughs> making it worse. And we're going to take us off topic, but I'll just tell a little story. So uh, my dad uh, immigrated from Europe, and he had a really heavy accent. And it just so happens that my wife is really well-spoken, and she speaks properly, and, and I mm. don't. And so every time that, you know, she'll correct me, I'll say, yeah, it's my dad. And so... 
because I'll say English is a second language for me because he spoke, you you know, (laughs) with such an accent at home. Gotcha. That's awesome. All right. So here's the question I'm adding to the table, and it's and it's it's we're going to shift from that too. Uh, I I heard you say it, and and you guys all kind of shook your head about like there's things as parents that you have kids that are parenting for the first time, you know, and there's things that you see that you want to say but you can't say for the sake of the relationship. For instance, you were saying, hey, we just mute it. If they ask us, we, we ask us, well, well, let me just put it out this way, and you don't have to give examples <laughs> of your kid. I mean, you can. <laughs> Seth thing yeah, right I here know. would be great. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but there's things that you've seen. You're, you're going to unmute us. Is that what you're about to do? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I want to unmute you. And I was like, what are the things that you see young dads and moms do that you're just like, look, when your parents say this, just listen to them. Like, you know, like they're, they're trying to help you. It's a good idea. This is a, 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 a typical thing that's, that I've seen maybe in several of my kids. Mm-hmm. Or it just repeats itself without like, you know, yeah, unmute. So, so <laughs> honestly, the, the most frustrating thing that I see in the emerging generation of parenting is they are training their children to uh, be, be more whiny and more... Uh, demanding and more getting what they want because they reward that behavior and if you you really want a child to continue to whine reward them when they do it or you want them to throw more fits give them what they want when they throw a fit you want them to it, it if you choose to never reward a bad behavior it will actually change the behavior and actually if you reward good behavior It'll make the children uh, follow that. Uh, Our oldest daughter, it was so hard to discipline her. Mm. And yet our youngest daughter, who was the fifth one in line, uh, it was so easy to discipline her because her older siblings had been trained. And we would say, for example, we had five young kids. Our oldest was six when our youngest was born, the fifth one. And... And we would say it's bedtime and the kids would go to bed and people would marvel mm-hmm. at that. Well, it was really hard to get our older ones to go to bed when we told them to. But by the time we had all of them, it was just they assumed this is what you're supposed to do because we expected them to do that. And so rewarding bad mm-hmm. behavior. And then we actually <coughs> tried to <coughs> applaud good things. The best way to get a kid to start doing something you want is affirm a kid who's doing that. Mm. And so we're good at critical information. We're Mm. not good at positive information. Mm. People want to be affirmed. And so if you affirm the kid that's doing the right thing, uh, I had my grandparents, uh, I had my grandkids at my house this weekend, and my uh, six-year-old granddaughter um, made her queen bed that's our guest bed. And it was, I was shocked. Mm. Well, our other two granddaughters trashed their bedroom. <laughs> and so so all day long, I just was admiring and just talking to my granddaughter about, you're so big and it's just amazing and you didn't expect Grand Pam to make your bed. You made it. And, the, and you next, can see it in their next, face. Next like morning, that. the five-year-old and three-year-old are making a king bed <laughs> <laughs> because they wanted yeah. that affirmation. Yeah. And I could have just said, man, you, I have animals living in this room and a person in this room. <laughs> and it wouldn't have gotten the same response. And mm. so I think that would be my unmuted thing. I, I'm going to take a little different tact. And um, so our youngest is uh, nearly 24. And uh, we have a nearly four-year-old granddaughter. And so, you know, the, it's been over 20 years since we had an adolescent in our house. And so my wife and I <laughs> took our, we, we had a, a lot of ideas mm-hmm. on uh, how we thought, you know, um, our granddaughter should be parented. And then we took her for a week. And, and uh, well, she, she's, a, she's an active, you know, rambunctious. And we thought we could, you know what I mean, fix uh, everything that we did like. <laughs> and frankly, we were just exhausted. Um, and my wife was frustrated with me because she did more of the work than I did, which is true. And, mm-hmm. But, you know, it was just really interesting that we said we were more gracious at the end of the week 
than we were at the beginning of the week. Mm -hmm. And it kind of goes back to, you know, the, the other thing is, oh, you're, you're not, you know, um, yeah, we, we were super grateful um, for our son and daughter-in-law, <laughs> you know what I mean, yeah. at, at the end of that week, because it was exhausting, you know, and we only had one, yeah, yeah, so. I think our unmute, which we have been slightly unmuted about, is, um, you know, we, we were business owners for the majority of our kids growing up, and mm -hmm. we spent so much time devoted to work. Um, I think we spent a good amount of time with the kids, too, um, but balancing that work-home life, I think, is a big thing for people right now, um, and probably always has been, but um, just knowing when to, it's time to turn off work and focus on the family, um, especially, in, you know, now with all the different work scenarios, it's just, um, I think it's important to say um, to especially young, young adults, because they're just starting their careers, and um, just not sure how to how to balance that is is probably our unmute thing to, to focus more on that family time. And what what would you guys say about electronics these days? Would you say it's hard for me to say because I spend too much time yeah <coughs> I spend too much time on my electronics. Um, and it is it's a major problem I think across the board for kids all the way up through adulthood. Um, so yeah, I think limiting the the number of hours based on how old they are and what they're actually doing or, or seeing, um, it's it has to happen. Yeah. Yeah, uh, electronics are hard. Mm -hmm. You know, for those of us that did not grow up with <laughs> such an accessibility, you know, and the the dependence mm -hmm. um, that you know children today. Um, have on what they can hold in their hand and the, mm -hmm. the, the amount of, it's so attractional, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? So I've got a four-year-old granddaughter and it's just so attractional what's there that I think sometimes it can mute, you know, how we interact with the world. Yeah, definitely. And um, it shouldn't be like that, right? right? I mean, the, um, God created uh, a fascinating universe mm -hmm. um, for us to experience, fascinating people for us to meet. And um, I, yeah, I, I fear for the parents of today, how will they, how will they balance that? Mm -hmm. I mean, that is a, that's a tough, mm -hmm. tough thing that, um, yeah, I, I'm glad that I already raised all my kids um, because, <laughs> you know, because um, I, I don't know how I yeah. do that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, I have a son who's eight. Mm -hmm. and yeah, Ernie I think, maybe can answer this well, question. Well, it's yeah. something that terrifies me yeah. because, uh, it, like, and I can see the difference. Like, when my, my son is regularly playing video games and stuff and, and on screens, mm -hmm. it, his demeanor as a member of it our draws family, him in. Yeah. It, yeah. Well, not only draws him in, it just his demeanor, even when he's off of it. Mm -hmm. You know, he's got a very addictive personality towards it, and like, it's all like when we when we make him fast or remove it from him, like, it's it, it, he's a better member of our family. Mm -hmm. like, he's a better brother. He's a, he's a better a better son. like we're better parents. Mm -hmm. And frankly, for me, just confession, like a lot of times that happens, it's just being a lazy parent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm being lazy, and I'm like, I don't want to engage. I want to sit and scroll on my phone. Right. Or I want to, you know, watch this show. So what can I do to get you quiet long enough for me to do this? Mm -hmm. And, it's, and it's, it's, it's what I do regularly. And I think it's – I was super convicted of it, actually, this past week where we had a, a very strong conversation with Jackson, and we, rem it, we removed the technology for I, I don't know how long, maybe forever. I, 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 you know, he's hoping for it back, but at some point he'll get it. But like, but uh, but but I was just as you were talking, I was thinking, how do I principalize this? How do I think about technology? And the thought that came to mind was like, is is what is technology enhancing the community of our family, or is it to the detriment of it? And and. Uh, I've been just really convicted as a, as a parent of being like needing to be more present and needing to be uh, a more involved. Like your sermon today was just, mm -hmm. I pulled my son aside and said, what did you hear him say that was true about me? Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. just let him speak. And I said, I'm sorry. And he, 
Luckily, he looked at me and goes, that's okay. No, nobody's perfect. And like walks <laughs> yeah. away. And I was like, all right, great. Yeah. I hope you're saying that when you're 16 or something. You know, like mm. um, when all the hormones kick in, I don't even know where to go with that. <laughs> but but that, that's a, a spot where, where it's, it is. And, and the, the thing about the electronic stuff is that it's, they really do talk. I feel like they target our kids mm -hmm. to mm. play it so that they can sell them stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they don't care how addictive it is. They don't care what it does to them. They just care how does it, and it's, 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 it's scary. Like, I don't, mm -hmm. I don't know. Like, we, me and Laura talk about that all the time, and we find less is better. Right. You know, mm -hmm. the less he's on, the, the better he is. The better he sleeps at night because yeah. mm -hmm. he can go outside and do stuff, you know. Like, mm, that's so we haven't found the answer. Mm -hmm. and But there's also an aspect of it, too, that I hear parents talk about regularly, where it's like, well, that's where all the kids are. If he's going to make friends, he needs to be able to play Fortnite or Minecraft. Like, because they, they, they speak digitally to one another now. Mm -hmm. It's But I find if you take it away, they still find friends. You know, I don't know. Any thoughts on that, guys? Yeah. I have thoughts. Give them. <laughs> well, no. It, okay. It's, it, it's, it's, it's really is. It, I, I didn't have a cell phone until I was 30. Mm -hmm. And so it's really hard to speak into a world that you shouldn't, right? And, and mm -hmm. so I think we need to be careful to raise up godly men, men and women in this generation who can reach the emerging generation. Mm -hmm. And it is going to be done in large degree with technology. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so if we disparage it, rather than actually learn to use it f for God's good and glory, mm -hmm. we'll, become, we'll become like the churches who only have organs, mm. right? Yeah. And I don't want to be that. I, want, I don't want to so sequester the Christian community because of something That's like good. electronics that could be really negative. Mm -hmm that all of a sudden we find ourselves so removed from the culture that we no longer can engage with lost people. Right. Mm. And so so I, I think we need to just parent it, but not parent it by just removing yeah, it. Yeah, right? like because Quakering I, it. I think that, yeah, yeah, because now <laughs> now we're asking them to do something that's really foreign to them. Mm -hmm. I mean, we used, to, we used to do a phone like this. Mm -hmm. No child does they a do phone this. like this. Right? I just saw that. Oh, yeah, you they, guys they said that, that on your podcast, right? And right? They, yeah. they do that, and you think, "What are you doing?" <clears throat> yeah. yeah, you know. Well, they've never held a phone. Uh -huh. Yeah, mm. <laughs> and seen the the bubble on the top right, and right. the bottom. <laughs> right, right. And and so it's. I mean, college kids, you know, they they've never been without technology, and so. Yep. It's true. Most, most guys that they're struggling with porn, it's not because they were flipping through a magazine, right? Right. right. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that's a good word. It's a good way to think about it. it. Brings a lot of balance too. I feel like what I've been experiencing as a parent recently, just like, is it's even maybe a lazy answer because like, well, if I just remove this, you're better. Mm -hmm. And I like, and I was like, there it is. And it's mm -hmm. in some ways, I think it. There's a limitation there, but there's a necessity. You have to figure out how to navigate yeah. it. Mm -hmm. I think it's. As parents, at least me, I wanted to solve the problem. Mm -hmm. You know, what I heard from you a little bit is, well, I just want to, I just want to solve it, and we've solved it by taking it away, mm -hmm. and realize it's, it's, it's going to be a tension that you're going to have to manage yeah. the whole time your your kids are at home, and you you just have to figure out, you know, how do you how do you teach them about God and nature and other people and the world they live in and have them live in it in a way that's attractional and appropriate. And yeah. we're never going to fix it, um, but you can shape it and manage it. 100%. I, I, and I just want to attack on that. I didn't get to say it this morning. It's in my notes. Uh, but I ran out of time. I always do. Um, boys stop on time. That's important. <laughs> um, we would love for our kids to engage with us in our world. Mm -hmm. But we don't often love to engage with them in theirs. And so take, for example, video games. Okay, our kids would crush us yeah. if we played video games with them. But we're just watching news or whatever. What's a, what's a better trade-off? What are we going to learn from watching another football game or another basketball game or a news show or even a show that we like that they wouldn't? <laughs> um, and, yeah. and 
it, uh, my kids and grandkids always really appreciate it <coughs> when I, they know how uncomfortable I am choosing to participate in their world. And they always feel actually, oh, that <coughs> felt loving mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. to do that. And so if we just say, oh, you play too much video law, and say, rather than say, hey, can I play? That blows them away. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. here's the other thing. If they're good at something, they actually like you watching them doing it. And so my sons, for example, if I don't disparage the game and just actually <coughs> watch, mm-hmm. watch them play, it's life-giving to them mm-hmm. because I'm present. Mm-hmm. And I think we need to be careful to do that as well. That's good. That's really good. Yeah. Well, hey, I got another question for us. Uh, it looks like a couple It says, how do you parent and discipline when you and your spouse don't always agree on the methods used? How do you navigate those conversations, I guess? <clears throat> Let's start with yours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, here's the softball. Yeah, thanks. thank you. Uh, I need a few more minutes. Um, yeah, so, you know, uh, like kind of like what we said before, like when the instant comes up, you don't have time to sit and discuss, okay, like how are we gonna handle this most most of the time. Um, oh, it's a hard one. Um, I think going in, like getting ahead of things, like when you're when your kids are small and they're starting to grow and you're you're experiencing those instances where those conflict and in, instances mm-hmm. that um, you talk about, okay, what did we do wrong? What, why didn't we agree on that? And then going forward, you kind of know you, you build a trust um, with one another on allowing that parent, the other parent to discipline mm-hmm. um, because you've already had kind of a boundary discussion mm-hmm. of, hey, I'm not comfortable with, with that way of disciplining for that reason or um, how, what if we tried this way next time? Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, what do you what think you, of my idea? What you can't do is let your kids divide you. Right. Because mm-hmm. they're already masters at that. The yes. worst thing you say to your kid is, ask your mom. Right. Or ask your dad. Mm. What you can say is, hey, yes. I'm going to talk to your mom, and then we'll get back to you. Or I'm yeah. going to talk to your dad. Or let us talk together, and then we get... And the same with discipline. <coughs> if you're not mm-hmm. on the same front, mm-hmm. and you have to be one on it. If you guys can't agree, you shouldn't do it. Mm-hmm. You should get to the place where you can close the door, decide what you're going to do to parent the child. Mm-hmm. Because having two different styles mm-hmm. of discipline or of parenting really is discombobulating to a child, mm-hmm. and they'll they'll and especially seeing it if if it's happening <clears throat> in live, right? And oh, yeah. you're you're disagreeing in front of them. That never goes over well, mm. um, because then they they'll just dismiss both of you. So right, yeah. My my wife and I would often disagree, and what was. Uh, what we learned to do is uh, disagree in private mm-hmm. and agree in public. Mm-hmm. And so if, let's say, um, she would be uncomfortable with how I disciplined a child or how I acted to a child, if she came out and said that right in front of us, then mm-hmm. I would get mad and the kid would be, you know, and it'd be all discombobulating. Mm-hmm. If she waited and said, you know, that night, hey, I was really uncomfortable with how you acted and then we could talk about that in private maybe shape me and then I could go back and fix it you know if it's Mm -hmm. something that needed to be fixed but you know God put a mom and dad together for a reason and you should you know like Troy said you know do what you can do together and agree on that and you know that's a powerful powerful thing for a child you know when mom and dad are united front they can't they can't get around it Mm -hmm. and and so you know that child is going to pay attention to that but if there's division then that child's going to figure out how to how to work that system and get right in between mom and dad so yeah disagree in private agree in public Mm -hmm. yeah and 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 let me just say this about marital conflict um the sins of the parents are visited on the children third and fourth generation, but the blessing of the parents go to a thousand generation. And so mm. if you really struggle with your kids being in conflict with each other, you have to ask the question, where are they getting that? <laughs> and, and 
if you give them permission to not act loving toward each other by the way that you don't act loving toward your spouse, you're going to create a house of turmoil. Whereas if they don't see that, it will feel like a dysfunction to them because they haven't seen that in the way that you treat your spouse. Because all they see is mom who <coughs> asked for kids. Yeah, I mean, they, mm-hmm. will, they will follow that pattern that you lay down for them. And so it doesn't have to be perfect, but... Uh, a unified marriage really builds a unified home. Yeah, I think too, since I know we have a lot of young marrieds mm-hmm. in our church mm-hmm. and very young families that are looking to expand, I, I, I think one of the things that I was very proactive about is I got around men and women that I respected that were parents and I watched what they did and I asked them lots mm-hmm. of questions. And even doing that with your spouse preemptively, mm-hmm. like before, mm-hmm. when you start having these conversations about having kids, mm-hmm that you could start shaping some of those things and then not be afraid to ask the advice of others, you know, like yeah. you know, of your parents or of other people around you. Those are things that could really help you start shaping and molding in that direction. And I, I love how you said, um, everything you guys said, I was like, I was just eating up. I love, and you're like, yeah, go ask your mother. I, I was like, oh, I see that all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, no. It's like, I don't know, go ask your mom. She says yes, I'm yes. <laughs> you know, it's, like, it's like, oh, okay, there we go. But, but even the disagree, me and Laura really try to do that where we, we can disagree in private, but in the moment, that unified front is really important. And hearing three others say that makes me feel better though. Makes me feel like a winner. You, know? <laughs> <laughs> you are a winner. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I got some some questions here. We're going to try to punch through a couple of them. Uh, it, one guy asked, if, hey, if I'm a single man, what what do you wish you'd known before preparing to be a father? Um, and then another one asked, like, how do you know if you're ready to have kids? And they said specifically financially. And so those specifically financially, how do you know if you're ready to have kids? But I think we should expand upon, we should hit that, but expand upon that question. Um, so with that first one, if, as a single man, how, you know, what do you wish you would had known and prepared for to be a father, you know? <clears throat> yeah, I think, um, I think sometimes we think that marriage or children will complete us or fix what's wrong with us, and it doesn't. Mm-hmm. Um, in fact, it, it exposes um, the sin that's inside of us. Um, oftentimes, and because there's there 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 are pressures, you know, oftentimes uh, fatherhood and marriage, and so um, I would say, um, yeah, uh, deal with deal with the sin that's in your life now, and don't think that that's something that um, marriage or family is going to fix. Cool. Anything to add, guys? Are good enough? It's good enough. All right. Yeah, going on that second one I think is great. How do you know if you're ready? Like, thinking of a young married couple, I want to, I, because they asked about the finances, I want to talk about that. But what are some things that should key in that, like, you're you're ready to start having kids? Yeah, I'm going to address the financial question because uh, my wife and I have, as, as I said at the beginning of the podcast, kind of two families. We have a, uh, we had our first five kids and we had almost nothing and then we adopted our second set of kids when we actually had um, significant success in ministry and my wife is also in (coughs) business and Mm -hmm. so uh, and and we have actually found that money hurts more than it helps when it comes to relationship and parenting because you afford to do things that actually erode often the community that you have when you can't afford to do things. Uh, Not being able to go out for to eat, not being able to purchase things forces you to be more relationally connected. And it is a proven statistical fact that the the wealthier that a person is, um, you just go to cultures all over the world. Healthy families are often sometimes in the poorest communities Mm. um, in the world. In our country, it's not so much so because they can see the greed and materialism all around. And so they think, I have to have this kind of status, this kind of car, this kind of house before I can add a child to it. Mm -hmm. What a child needs is love. Mm -hmm. What a child needs is attention. 
And mm. so uh, I, I would be <clears throat> careful to <laughs> have so much in your bank account before you right. decide to, mm. to have a child. So. I would agree with that too. We, you know, we, we, when we decided to have our first child, we didn't have insurance um, to, you know, to deliver a baby. Mm. So obviously we went to a clinic to do that and they turned out just fine. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, I, I would, I hear that question a lot too. Like, when is it, when I'm financially ready? You're never going to be financially ready for a child. Like, they they drain your bank account all the way through, you know? Like <laughs> so uh, there's never there's never a number that you can mm -hmm. can have, and you just mm -hmm. uh, you make do with what you have, basically. So. Yeah, those are great answers. Yeah, yeah, and I think too, I I don't know how I would even answer the question how how you get ready to be a parent. Like, mm -hmm. it's such a transformational thing, mm -hmm. and it's. How do you get training wheels for that, you know? Mm. Yeah. Sounds like you I mean, kind of have an answer. Well, I mean, in one sense, um, the way you learn um, how to be a parent is by being a parent. Um, right. Mm -hmm. And so it's very, very difficult to pre <coughs> prepare right. um, to it, be it a It is. Parent. Yeah. It, it, but it is also true, though, that if you have a, come from a particularly broken Mm -hmm. uh, family environment, we all tend to practice what we experience, whether our experience was good or bad. Mm -hmm. I, I love the progressive commercials. We tend to become like our parents. It's really true. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so if your experience in family was really bad, that's why the church is so beautiful. You need to get around mm -hmm. families that are functional and healthy mm -hmm. so that you can see good models that you can emulate. That's, that's why we have older men and women in our church. That's why we actually have parents. And it's okay for you to want to be mentored and ask questions mm -hmm. and to not assume that you don't know, especially if you're in an abusive home or an alcoholic's home or, you know, a, a divorced family or multiple marriages. or you, Because you don't want to bring that experience into your new Christian family. And so I would, I would encourage you to get around people who you want your family to be like theirs and get as close as you can to them and learn from their life. Mm -hmm. So the last question was, how should a parent respond, be love, uh, slash be loving, if their kid tells them they're gay or transgender, et cetera? What do you do when your kid is doing something that you would see from your values as a destructive lifestyle? So. Yeah. Um. Uh, we had experience in our family, and I'll start, and these guys can add on to it, but we ex where um, a, f a family member had a significant other um, that was transgender. And um, my, my mom was the one that was really struggling with how to relate to this individual. And I said, Mom, you know, you're, you're only going to have one granddaughter, and um, you should love her, you know, and... It doesn't matter, um, and so you don't have to, you know, condone, but you you have to love, and you know, just that alone, because she felt like by you know she was somehow accepting by loving, and that's that's not what it is, and so just that alone, you know, was helpful for mm -hmm. her to take a step in that direction, just because it was so foreign to her. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I I think that the culture is going to get worse, not better. And we have lived in a culture in this country where the words of Jesus don't ring true. What he says is, if you follow me, people are going to hate you and despise you because of me. Well, it's not because of who he was. It's because of what he said is true and right, mm -hmm. moral and immoral. And so... Yet, the most broken people on the face of the earth in Jesus' day never felt unloved or uncared for by him. Mm. But he never compromised what he believed about their behavior or their activity. And so I think it is important for us to try to emulate Jesus in that, knowing that we stand on truth. This world is going to reject us, and it's going to get worse and not better. Mm -hmm. They killed the perfect son of God. Yeah. Right? But at the same time, anybody who we know, and especially a fam family member who's embraced a cultural value that's not a Christian value, 
they need to feel our love and our mm -hmm. care, not our judgment. Mm -hmm. uh, because love doesn't mean you have to accept what they believe. Um, uh, so, so there's there's always that truth in love continuum and balance that we have to have. Mm -hmm. I, I agree with both of you. Um, and, you know, I think almost every family has encountered this now, but um, I think just having a conversation, I think so many people uh, that may be transgender or in that realm would think that as a Christian that you're not going to accept me um, and you're not going to be able to love me. But having that conversation of, let me show you how I can love you like don't let don't put that wall up between us just because mm -hmm. that's what you think because I can still love you even though I don't condone it. Um, so that I think a conversation has to happen mm -hmm. um, to get that point across and, and to be able to show that we can that we can still love and we can still have a relationship mm -hmm. even though we don't agree on everything. It's it's ironic that as people who have experienced the most grace of any people, oftentimes we as Christians can be super judgmental. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so um, somehow we have to reflect that what Christ has done for us. Yeah, I mean, the name of your church is Mercy Hill. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. And the definition right. of mercy is is not giving you what you deserve, mm -hmm. which is judgment and hell and condemnation. Right. Mm -hmm. Instead, you get grace. Right? Yeah. yeah. And so your church, <coughs> man, mm -hmm. you Better. chose a name, dude. Well, well, we I'm want it for I'm a, coming a to this church on this hill to get this thing called mercy. That's right. right. <laughs> That's right. So. That's right. Yeah, it's, I think it's, is that, what's the first thing people feel when, they're, when they encounter you mm -hmm. in that area is, is really important that they, it's love, it's mercy, it's grace. And and honestly, Ernie, there's always a story. Mm -hmm. And I've never ran into someone who has any kind of dysphoria that that is unwilling to tell you that story. Mm -hmm. And it'll break your heart most of the time to hear it. Yeah. And then you'll have at least a, a empathy and sympathy for what they've gone through <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, that maybe went down. Yeah, that's true. Well, guys, I would love to sit here and talk even more, but we're, we're going above an hour, and so we're going to close it out. Thank you guys for coming and doing this and being vulnerable and honest and open. We try to answer as many of your questions as possible. We didn't get to all of them, but in some way, shape, or form, I felt like we answered all of them, just not maybe directly. Uh, thank you guys for listening, and we'll see you all next week when we talk about work. We're going to have Chris Cook and some other guests here and talk about, man, God's vision for being an employer and an employee and how we're meant to be godly men and women in the workforce. But see you guys later.